Good morning. It's good to see all five of you here today. Um, obviously, we're going through the next wave, and uh, Roger's out of town, Roger and Forrest and Janae. Uh, I can't remember if they went to California or Florida. 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 So they might be back this week. Uh, if their, plate, their flight is not canceled, um, there's a lot of people staying where they went uh, lately, it seems like. Uh, but hopefully everybody that, that's got it or, or has come in contact will, will uh, fare very well. Um, I, I spoke a couple of times last year about a particular topic called uh, spectator or participator and spent a lot of time in Ephesians 4, having to do with that, 11 through 16. I'm not gonna talk about that this morning. Um, I've wanted to talk to you for quite a long time. Um, it's, it's been three, a little over three months since I was extubated in the hospital. Uh, three and a half months since I was intubated, since I was out of it. Uh, for, for quite a while before now, uh, I didn't speak very well. I still don't speak very well. But uh, but but with my there's problem with my speech. Of course, uh, today I could be fairly understandable for all of you. There's a problem with my voice. Uh, problem having to do with my breath. Uh, problem having to do with singing. I think that you know I love to sing. Uh, it's always been something that I loved, and it's really difficult right now to, to lead singing and that sort of thing. Uh, but I still want to do it. My understanding is that it takes a year after, after, after you've had a stroke for them to set a baseline. That even old people like me, uh, your brains tend to heal themselves uh, to a certain, percent, uh, certain percentage that you build up the synapses again. And uh, there are some things that have to do with the stroke that, uh, that, that I may never overcome. It may just always, always be that way. Uh, as vain a person that I am, I lost 25 pounds, believe it or not, while I was in the hospital. And lest you be worried, I found it all again. <laughs> not a problem. Uh, another thing that's kind of a problem to me is I'm losing my hair. Uh, from what I understand from reading that after you've had COVID or after you've had a high fever that you can lose your hair three to six months after you've been healed. And then it can take nine months for it to begin to grow back. Uh, it's a problem for me. I don't like that. I've always bragged about I will never go bald. But uh, hopefully I won't do that. Uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of people here uh, last time we had a small crowd was, of course, the last uh, a big wave, which was in September, October. We have more people, I think, that we had back then that were able to be here. Hopefully, everybody has recovered well and, and will recover well. wanted to, to say the reason I wanted to talk to you is for various things, but first I want to thank you. Thank the congregation for being uh, such a help uh, to me and my family. Uh, there was a lot of grace uh, that was shown uh, to me during that time, uh, a lot of grace toward my family and taking care of them. They were all here from Michigan, from, uh, from California and all helping. And, uh, and if we're grateful to, for that, if we're grateful for the prayers. Uh, prayers, prayer means a lot. Uh, I was hearing from people uh, cards praying from Virginia that I don't even know. Uh, they know people that I know. Uh, hearing from people from California that I barely know, that know my mom real well, and, uh, and, and know the Wells real well. And all. it was nice to hear from them, but praying for me uh, for my recovery uh, during that time. Um, there, there's a different perspective, though. My, my uh, laughing perspective was, Everybody was partying at my house while I was dying in the hospital. And uh, that, of course, isn't true, but there's a lot of things that were happening, uh, happening at my house, happening here, that I will never see. I will never know. Um, I tried to watch some of the uh, recordings from here during the time. Some are, the, are just not there. Some are not online. And so I'll never, I'll, I'll never know exactly. Debbie will relate some things to me. To me 
or I'll hear from people at work uh, will relate something to me that I was totally unaware of. That being a singular person in the hospital, um, like I was, I only had one perspective. And one, the one perspective was between me and God. Uh, that, that that was who I was communicating most with, and also my perspective ha having to do with my wife. Uh, that I, although I appreciate everything, I was, I was in there thinking of only God and my wife that I would leave behind. And I, I, I was thinking, as I was thinking about talking about this, I was thinking about Paul, what Paul said also in Philippians. In Philippians 1, verses starting at verse 21, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire to, part, to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Uh, that, that at the time I was thinking that it would be troublesome for my wife, uh, leaving her behind, and I've mentioned here before, especially having to do with my house, uh, that that hopefully when I call her and talk to her, uh, I, I I told her I felt like I was right with God, uh, that I was communicating, uh, that that I had made some decisions, and the first thing she was to do was to get with my sons-in-law and sell the house, and uh, and she could live. Uh, live okay off, off of that, uh, but pretty self-centered. Uh, being in the hospital, uh, being uh, thinking about my wife, my mind was 50-50. Could live here, could live in the flesh among all of you, all of you, or I could be with God. I could be waking up on the other side and being with God. And during the time that I was in, uh, I was in telemetry before they put me in ICU. Uh, a lot of texts. A lot of texts I appreciated. I was also, if you're familiar with Marco Polos, I was getting a lot of uh, Marco Polos and I couldn't answer. I was unable to, to, to answer during that time. Doesn't mean it didn't mean anything. It just means that I couldn't answer you um, at the time that I was, that I was sick. Um, I was looking more toward God's grace. Real, realizing laying there uh, as an individual, and probably most people, I, I can't imagine laying there and, and feeling proud before God uh, that I realized my own inadequacy uh, while I was laying there, and it was just between me and Him, and praying for Him, praying that God's grace is real. As we see it in the scriptures, that I felt confident uh, that I would be waking up on the other side with God, if not, if not here uh, at all kept looking for the spirit world then. Uh, Paul also said in, in Philippians 3, Philippians 3, 8 through 11, he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of it, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, uh, becoming like him in his death, if by any means possible, possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That those, those things that, that Paul was see, saying and experiencing were real. Uh, I was laying there thinking about that. I was also, also thinking about uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians. Uh, he talks about something that he had experienced, but wouldn't even use himself as an example there. In 2 Corinthians 12, starting verse 2, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I, knew, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard, and he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. There's something that's very far better that we, we become comfortable in this life. We have it pretty good in the United States, I think. 
uh, the wealth that we have here, uh, but realizing that everything that's here, we're going to leave behind. And there's something that's very far better that we're looking, looking forward to. We're, we're either, I was thinking about staying here or receiving glory, being on the other side, being with Christ. One of the things I was, I was doing, uh, laying there, I didn't realize while I was intubated that they were waking me up. Um, I thought I was dreaming. I thought I would go from one dream into the next dream. Uh, one dream would be over and over again, and uh, I would wake up in a room where there was brown, brown paneling. And it occurred to me after a while of waking up that this was not heaven, uh, that heaven is not paneled in brown wood. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was either in a state where my body just wasn't going to wake up, that I was just going to be dreaming, or there was something real that was happening. Uh, the same people kept showing up uh, when I would be in this brown paneled room and uh, asked me if I was okay and introduced themselves. And uh, I've mentioned to some of you that I hated Shannon and I hated Trevor and I hated Troy uh, because uh, I thought they were people of my dreams. Uh, later, on, <laughs> later on when I woke up uh, after being exhibited, um, I told them that I loved them for, for help, helping me out. Um, my, my mom related a story to me uh, of a sister in Christ that had been uh, in the same situation. She had been put out, probably extubated and, and all uh, really poor health. And she expected to die. She expected to be on the other side. And when the hospital woke her up uh, on this side in the flesh, she was very mad. She was very angry uh, that she was on this side, that she had wanted to experience uh, God. But the thing that happened with her is her husband had not been a Christian. Christian, he had uh, he had put this put this off, and after she came to and all, uh, later on he became a Christian. So there was good that came from her particular thing. You may not get what you want, uh, but God's will be done. Uh, it was probably more important to see her as be, been uh, become a Christian after. Uh, she was awake. Makes me really think about the idea that God put eternity in our hearts. Um, we, we, I think we as people, I can't accept the idea that I would come out of existence altogether. Uh, that I would live here on the earth, live my life, um, have what effects I do, the relationships that I do, uh, the family that I have, the work that I do, that it all comes to naught. Uh, there is a certain coming to naught in that all that happens on earth is vanity, uh, but, but I, I, I always picture the idea of going on and on. I think it's natural within man. It's something that God has put in us. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. It's something that, that is there that we understand that, we know. We can't see it from the backside. We can't see necessarily things that happened before we existed, but we can't see ourselves failing to exist as time goes on in the, in the future, that, uh, that God has put eternity in our hearts. Uh, Paul said something at, at the uh, Areopagus. Roger has alluded to this uh, quite a bit the last few weeks. Uh, that we think that we realize that God has put himself in there. In uh, Acts 17, starting verse 20, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God in hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is, not actually, yet he is actually not far from each of us. In him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. 
that we have this knowledge within us, we have this feeling within us, uh, we have this built within us that there is God out there, we're looking for him, and that he has put eternity into us. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12, finishing up the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, it says, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and help, uh, uh, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. We aren't complete without God. We aren't complete realizing his eternity and uh, that we have eternity also. Uh, Jesus tells us more. Uh, Jesus tells us more uh, when he was alive. In, act, in Luke 16, uh, most of us, or all of us, uh, should know the idea, or the, uh, the, what's called the parable, is, uh, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And uh, we realize uh, Lazarus is a poor man laying in the streets, uh, that he's begging that the, law, the dogs come up and lick his wounds, and the rich man just passes him up and, uh, and lives uh, very well. They both go to uh, the other side, uh, to the spiritual side, Luke 16. Luke, Luke 16, uh, especially verse 22, starting there, says the poor man died and was carried by angel, angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades. Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner uh, bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and then may cross from there. So we, we, we hear that from Jesus being on the other side. Have you thought about the idea of standing next to Abraham, uh, being, uh, being in paradise with, with him? For the uh, followers of Christ, there is comfort. We also see that idea in John 11. And uh, John, or, or Jesus' friends realize that. Uh, we, we know the story of, of Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, the brother of Mary and Martha, uh, that he passed away, uh, that he passed away while Jesus was, was gone. And uh, in verse 21 through 26, uh, Martha realizes all of that. Uh, 21 through 26, it says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my, bro my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he will live. And everyone who lives and believes shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And we know this, the, the story given uh, that Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead after four days. But Martha knew. Martha knew he would wake up again on the other side if he was not risen from the dead in the flesh. And so Jesus gives us that particular comfort. Comfort. He gives us that comfort also uh, with uh, Peter uh, having to do with Dorcas. Dorcas. Uh, thinking about the idea, going back and, and, and just capturing some idea, realizing that the person that, that's, that is passing away, that is on the spiritual side, will be in a happy place. We, we say that. He's in a far better place. But realize that those that you leave behind are going to be sad. There's going to be a saddened way. And I think that that makes us a lot of times where we say that this is a bittersweet time. Uh, we see people that pass away uh, that we realize our own loss and uh, our, our own uh, worrying 
uh, thinking about about Dorcas, let's 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 look at at her in uh, Acts nine, Acts nine thirty eight through thirty nine. She was a sister in Christ. Uh, she was good at making clothes, and uh, Acts nine uh, starting at verse thirty eight. Uh, Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him. Please come to us without delay. So Peter went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she, while she was with them. Uh, of course, she's raised from the dead uh, by Peter a little bit later. But had she been in a dead state, had she lived on the spiritual side, what joy she would have had on the other side. Uh, but evidently she had more work to do here. She needed to be raised from the dead by Peter uh, to help others believe, but she also had, had some other, uh, other things to accomplish. So, so I was thinking about, about the idea that uh, for the last couple of years we've had this uh, COVID thing uh, going on uh, to where a lot of Christians are scared. Uh, a lot of uh, Christians are scared to go out, uh, out at all. But there's a lot of things that can kill us. Uh, they're part of life on this, this earth. Uh, part of life on this earth and the flesh is that we're all going to die. Um, I'm, I'm 63 years old. I'll be 64 in a couple of months. Uh, that We might say that's too young. Uh, I remember years ago saying, wow, 64, how old is that? Uh, that it doesn't feel so old at this. Uh, what was it? Uh, this la the last couple of days, Meatloaf died. Uh, some of you know who he is. Some of you probably don't. Uh, he was in his mid 70s. I'm getting to the point to where mid 70s doesn't sound so old. Uh, it sounds fairly, uh, fairly young. But we're all going to die. Uh, we're all going to die at different times. Current pandemic. Uh, causes a lot of Christians to be focused inward. Uh, that we're thinking about ourselves, that we're thinking about saving our fleshly, fleshly life. And, uh, and in a lot of places, there are people that aren't attending uh, any of their services at all because they're scared. Um, I didn't put this in the notes, but, but thinking about the idea of why are we Christians in the first place? Uh, that, that some of the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, especially talks about the, what we call the afterlife, uh, that, that our body, like this is, uh, 2 Corinthians talks about it being like clay, uh, being something that's fragile, something that can, uh, that can break over time. But it's only the beginning of, of our life. I may live here for 80 years, but what a drop in the bucket. It's not even a drop in the bucket compared to what, uh, to my living uh, eternally. Uh, that we talk about faith in Christ, but but a lot of that has to do with our eternity, how how we're going to live after after this. As Christians, we should have an idea or a thought of death uh, that is above what the world is. The world looks at death as a hopeless kind of thing. We should not look, look at that. We should look at that as a victory. Uh, we should look at that as, as uh, in a way it seems, so, it seems kind of selfish in a certain way, uh, that, that victory and joy and rest with God People that experience that on the earth from the other side sense the loss, the sadness, and all because of this person that has passed away. So I was thinking about the idea that in the United States, probably modernized Western culture, that as a general rule, we're not, faith, we're not uh, we don't experience death the same way that it's experienced a lot in uh, the rest of the world. Uh, Debbie and some of you others, I think the Hastings have uh, contact with various Africans, African pre preachers and all. And uh, when I'm, cert when I'm uh, uh, stalking Facebook, I see a lot of Debbie's friends are preachers in Zimbabwe 
and and some other places in Africa. And and just as a as a thought, uh, I wrote down some things. Uh, one of the preachers that contacts her, his name is Muhendo Kenson. And this is, this is an average, usual uh, type of uh, email that she, that she gets from him. Heavy rain today. We worshiped at our homes because of no completed building. Sadly, my nephew passed away. And then a couple of days later, uh, he wrote, Death Pains. Two days back, I lost my nephew. Now my sister passed away. She's got hypertension. This world is not our home. We don't usually think about that a lot. We've seen some deaths this last, last year over a period of time, uh, but it's not unusual to get a letter from this, from this man, that's, uh, from these men, these preachers, um, that someone in their congregation has passed away, that someone is suffering cancer, that someone is suffering some, some uh, uh, problems that they've had, they've had uh, furniture st stolen out of their, their buildings. They walk for hours to, uh, to go to a, uh, a worship service, a gathering of saints. We have it pretty easy. We drive here in the car. Uh, if it's going to be a little bit slick, sometimes we cancel uh, assembly. But they go through they go through a lot of pains uh, to be Christians. With all of that said, with all the troubles that they have, we get more uh, emails, Facebooks of them baptizing someone, baptizing people, more and more and more and more people. That even with the hardships, a lot of people are becoming Christians. They see death all the time. Probably at one time, uh, we saw that more in our country as extended families lived together, uh, as the old people lived in our homes, that we were preparing the body for burial after someone died, the grandmother, grandfather died in our home. Now, now we, we uh, warehouse that uh, sort of thing. Uh, we send those people out. We don't prepare the body. We're not contacted with death. And maybe because we're not in contact with death, maybe that's, that's uh, we get complacent. Uh, it's easy to not see that, not realize that that's real, but that's real. And, uh, and it comes back. I feel like I haven't said that very well, uh, but not unusual. Uh, that they, they have deaths, they have dangers, they have thefts, uh, they have hardships. They have joy that they're Christians, and they, they send pictures of joy because they're baptized. We see uh, many people being baptized and becoming Christians over in, uh, over in Africa. So I was, I was uh, after I was excavated, uh, Debbie wanted to read some uh, Bible to me. And I think I had been uh, recovered one or two days, and she read the book of James to me. And, uh, and it was very emotional uh, for me, uh, thinking about uh, the book of James that I think I taught it last year, and really the idea that, that James is described as some as the Proverbs of the, the New Testament, uh, that it's a bunch of disjointed things that are said uh, having to do with Christianity and that sort of thing. But what, what she read in James, reading that whole book, is how much of it has to do with our lives in Christ. Uh, that I'll probably think of it differently in the future, having to do with my life here in the flesh as a Christian, as, as following Christ. And of course, I wrote down a whole bunch of passages. My first thought was just to come in and read the book of James to you. Uh, but it may not mean the same thing to you as it did to me at the, at the particular time. Uh, so I'm going to, although I've got a, a, a big list down here of things I want to re read from James, there's two in particular that I'm going to read just to, uh, just to finish this out. Uh, first, we're going to look at, the, uh, at the, whole, the whole fifth chapter. The whole fifth chapter. There's one other passage that I want to read in the uh, fourth chapter, but, but in the fifth chapter. James 5, 
It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You who have heard of the, right, of the steadfastness, steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with nat a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain. And then he prayed again, and, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings it back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Hopefully you'll take that idea, those ideas that come out from there, uh, into your hearts that that we know that there's a time coming when our when our lives will uh, will come to an end. Just thinking about people that we know, right? Uh, Julie last year, uh, Julie last uh, August. Julie was my age. Julie was Julie would have turned 63 at the end of last last year. Um, Joy, uh, Joy, a couple of years ago, we think that she lived to the ripe old age. Uh, but it came, it, it came, and it was death. It was something that we expected from her. Some of you know Cameron, uh, Cameron Bauman. He was in his mid-20s uh, when he passed away from cancer that he had. Uh, that, that was something that he saw his whole life in front of him. He had cancer, and he passed away. Some of you are familiar you're with Rosie that used to be a member here, uh, that, that she got cancer, and she passed away. Many of you know Dottie. Uh, Dottie, uh, they were here a couple of years ago. Um, Dottie was in her 70s. We would say that she probably lived a, a full life, but she lived a life that, would, that had a lot of unhealth to it. Some of you know Don Buzga. Uh, years ago, when he passed away, he was in his mid-20s. Mid twenties, he was twenty-five, and talking to him at twenty-five years old, he said, "But I have plans." He knew that there was possibility that he would pass away from the brain tumor that he had. Uh, that that he he said, "But I have plans." And you look at that particular guy; he had uh, graduated from BSU, had lined up a, a teaching uh, job in Hawaii, was getting ready to. Uh, proposed to his uh, girlfriend, Yumi, uh, before, before he passed away. I have plans, but God had different plans for him. Uh, that could come for any time 
uh, for us. Just one other passage that I'd like to read, uh, that this especially uh, meant something different than it had meant uh, before. Um, I make plans for tomorrow, for the next day, for uh, days to come. And the scriptures talk about the idea of make, making future plans, and we do. Uh, but, but we realize also from scripture that God could take you in a heartbeat, uh, that I could pass away uh, quickly. And, uh, and I think that this, this passage points to that. In uh, at James chapter 4, starting at verse uh, 13, it says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What, your, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live or do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, uh, for, for him, it is sin. We make plans. Of course, we make plans. But there's a certain reality that, uh, that we live according to God's will. And, and God could take us. There could be some tragedy that happens. I've known people that have passed away in an instant on their way home from some particular place. Uh, but the question is, are, are you ready? Uh, that's really the thought for, uh, for now. I would go home and read James. Look at that. Look at that whole book, how you ought to live, how you ought to be married to God, uh, perhaps even a little bit better uh, than you than you are now are these your characteristics do you think like james does uh, will you lo live long or will you be one that lives uh, short do you live such as you might meet god tomorrow that's always true possibly true for uh, for each one of us uh, that's all i've got uh, i probably talked too long uh, but uh, do you want to live for God, I guess is the question. And uh, of course, uh, talking today had nothing to do with becoming a Christian. Uh, we recognize as we, we read the scriptures that, uh, that we believe in him, we hear his word, we believe in him, uh, we, uh, we repent, we change our minds concerning sin, and we change then our actions concerning sin. Uh, we're willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son, uh, that he's the saving one for each one of us, and that we are baptized. Not that we're working our way to salvation, but when I'm dunked in the water, God does the work. The Holy Spirit is the one that saves us when we, uh, when we follow him through obedience. Um, if you would like to become a Christian, uh, or if you would like to ask for prayers of the congregation, uh, please come forward as we stand and sing this song.